We're going to start today with this verse that you've seen on the screen for a while out of 1 Chronicles chapter 16. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his love endures forever. And we're going to use that verse as kind of our theme verse and tie it into Psalm 103, the section of scripture that I uh, read today for our call to worship. And I want to speak today about the benefits and blessings of Thanksgiving. Uh, something about this year, it just kind of crept up on me all of a sudden, I think, on Thanksgiving. And I don't know if the rest of you feel that way this year or not. I know it's always the same Thursday of, of uh, each year, but for some reason it seems like it came early this year. I don't know why. But, uh, uh, you know, this Thursday we're going to, uh, each of us, be observing it and... Uh, so I thought I might uh, speak a little bit about what it means to give some thanksgiving to God. And notice in Psalm 103, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. I, I like this psalm for several different reasons. And it might be because it, it really directs our attention to how great and how glorious God is. If you've read the psalm before, you may have seen the phrase before about bless the Lord, but perhaps you've not paused to think about how many times that that phrase is used, and it's used six times. It's used in verses 1 and 2, verses 20 and 21, and then down in verse 22, it says bless the Lord a couple of times. So that's what we're going to be speaking about today, giving thanksgiving. And the question that is before us this morning is what does it mean to bless the Lord? And, uh, you know, we, sometimes we have language that we use, words that we speak, and we never pause to reflect about the real meaning of those words. It means to praise or to exalt his name. And when you exalt something, you are lifting it up, you are giving it a place of prominence. And, and uh, when you were playing Little League Baseball and you won one of those little trophies, you know, like that, you, tra you treasured that for years until finally maybe you you've moved home after college or moved home after the military or something and then you're wondering why you kept that little dinky trinket that meant so much to you when you were a kid but it had an exalted position in your life at that time but blessing the lord it's an awe-filled expression of our love and gratitude to god for all that he's done for us and this is the time of year uh, that i think from now to about the end of the year thanksgiving and christmas that we think more about the blessings that we have in our lives and that we pause to reflect on all that God has done on our behalf. In Psalm 103, it really says that we have several different blessings. Six of them certainly are mentioned. It speaks about forgiveness. It speaks about healing, redemption, love, satisfaction, and renewal. But the question is, really, how thankful are we? I mean, sure, we, we pause in, in November around Thanksgiving and think about it and speak about, you know, how God good is and that we, we want to thank God for what he's done in our lives. But what about January and February and March, you know, and the other, other months of the year and the days that fill those months? How often do we pause and give thanks? And are we as a society as thankful as we once were? Well, as I was thinking about this, this particular verse out of 2 Timothy chapter 3 came to mind. Paul said, difficult times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanders, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power, avoid these people. And I'm, I'm wondering, is, is our society characterized by this mindset now? Or are we, are we a thankful and a grateful people? I think it's easy for us to slide down into the negative territory I think it's very easy us to go along with the crowd and we see everything that's wrong instead of seeing what's right and pausing to give God thanks for what's right and what's good in our lives. Henry Ward uh, Beecher, a preacher from the 1800s, once said, Pride slays thanksgiving, but humble mind is the soil out of which thanks naturally grows. 
A proud man is seldom a grateful man, for he never thinks he gets as much as he deserves. You know, he lifts himself up in pride. Now, there's nothing wrong with some satisfaction about some of your accomplishments in life. I think that's healthy. But it's where a person is so narcissistic that they think they can do it all without God and that everything they have is of their own wisdom, their own strength, their own making, and they give God no credit. And I think that's part of what ties into what Timothy uh, was hearing from the Apostle Paul about how unthankful we can be. But the psalmist tells us that we need to bless God and that we need to bless him. We need to give thanks. We need to have a spirit of gratitude for several different reasons. One of those is because he pardons our sins. Notice in this verse, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. We ought to pause and thank God that he's forgiven us of our sins. And regardless of what we've done in the past, when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he paid for all of those sins. And what we need to do is we need to go and we need to ask God for that forgiveness and we need to claim it. And that is one of the benefits that we have is regardless of what we've done in time past, God has forgiven it. And he's removed it as far as the east is from the west. Now, somebody said one time that the reason he said that, it was stated this way in this psalm, is because we have a north pole and a south pole and we can measure that distance. But we don't measure east from west when we think about the entirety of the world. There's another verse that says God deposits our sins in the deepest seas, indicating that they're out of his mind once he's forgiven us. We need to bless God for his compassion. Notice again in Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Now, aren't you glad that God is slow to anger? And in contrast to the anger, he's abounding in mercy or steadfast love. And I'm so glad that God abounds in that. Because we all trip up, we all stumble, we all wander off and go astray from time to time. But God is always there to open up his arms and to love us and to share his mercy and his compassion with us. Alexander White once said, in these verses, in Psalm 103, we have the law court. God pardons all of our iniquities. We have the hospital. He heals all of our diseases. We have the slave market. He redeems our lives, he says, from the pit. We have the throne room, for he crowns us with loving kindness and compassion. And we have the banquet hall, for God satisfies our spirits with good things. And for this, we need to be grateful. I'm going to give you five benefits of giving thanks. And we're told in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 to do exactly that. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now let me pause to, to just kind of say this, or ask this. If you were writing this verse, how would you have written it? In some things give thanks? Because we know there's time in our lives where it's difficult to give thanks. And I think the idea in this verse is, is regardless of what the situation or the circumstance might be, and regardless of how harsh the trial regardless of how strong the grief we know that god is still in control and in spite of what has happened to us with god things are going to be better we need to give thanks first and foremost because it keeps our focus on the good things of god and his presence when we are focusing on what god is doing for us we don't have time to focus with what else is wrong in the world you know, there's been times where we've seen a, a, had a tragedy and the TV has played it 24 hours a day showing the 9-11 the, the with the, plane, you know, the, the jets flying into the towers or some other tragic event, the space shuttle, you know, blowing up. And, uh, and people have gotten depressed because they spent days in front of the TV watching the, watching the agony, watching the tragedy, and living it out and over and over again because that's what their focus was. 
And we need to make sure that we take time to focus on what God is doing. Yes, there's a lot wrong in the world, but there's a lot that we need to pause and give thanks God for what he is doing and lift up his name and exalt it. So first, we need to give thanks because it keeps our focus on the good things of God and his presence, that he is alive and well and working in our lives. Second, giving thanks to God reminds us of our dependence on the Lord. Notice what the psalmist said in Psalm 34. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Now, when we are thanking God for what he is doing in our lives, we begin to realize that he will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus the Lord, Philippians 4.19. And it makes us, in, in kind of a logical sense, realize that God is at work. You know, when, when, uh, uh, when, when I'm focusing on these good things, it's because God is at work in my life and I am dependent on him and I'm not independent from him. And that I can go to God at any time, at any hour, any day of the week and pray and ask him to work in my life. Number three, giving thanks is an essential ingredient to the recipe for joy. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18, it, it speaks about being joyful in all things and giving thanks in all things. And the truth is you can't have joy in all things if you're not giving th thanks in all things. Um, I was drinking a cup of coffee with one of my friends the other day and he decided that he was gonna go in the kitchen and bake something. And then uh, when he brought it out of the oven, it didn't taste right. So he's trying to figure out what went wrong and he looked at the ingredients he put in and the baking soda expired about 25 years ago. And, uh, and so he said, well, I was wondering if it was really bad or not. You know, I mean, 25, you know, the, I mean, it's really past date. It was almost past the date they started dating things. But, uh, but uh, so he read on the internet how to, how to see if the baking soda was good. I guess you put it in the water and if it fizzles or fuzzes or bubbles up, it means it's still good. And he says the water didn't do anything. So... Uh, but see, that baking soda was an, was an essential ingredient, and without it, the recipe failed. And we need to realize that the joy and the thanks that we have in God is an essential ingredient to the vitality of our Christian faith. Why would anybody want to be a Christian if all they see is somebody who's miserly, who sees somebody that's always mad, a grump, or somebody who is always complaining. We of all people ought to be joyous. We of all people ought to be thankful. And when we give thanks, we focus on those things. And the more we give thanks, I see that there's other things I ought to be giving God thanks for. Paul, keep this in mind. He was sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. That's 2 Corinthians 6.10. Now, I doubt any of us have had it as rough in our Christian experience as Paul had it. He was beaten with a whip to the point of death. He was stoned. People pick up, picked up rocks and threw at him. He was shipwrecked about three times, snake bit several times, uh, unjustly and wrongly imprisoned. But Paul was always joyful. He said, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, and again I say rejoice. And he said that when he was under arrest in, in the Philippi, or excuse me, Rome, when he wrote to the church at Philippi. So Paul realized that that joy was an essential ingredient to what his work for Christ and what he might accomplish. Number four, giving thanks gives us an eternal perspective. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Paul said, do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal." When you're feeling down and out and wondering, you know, how in the world you can be so miserable, stop and think about what your focus is. There's a good chance you're focusing on the temporary instead of the eternal. 
And I know we have to pay attention to the temporary. I know that we have bills to be uh, paid. I know that we have vehicles that break down. Uh, I know that, that, uh, that uh, you know, the price of haircuts are going up, but I, I never worry about that myself. And, uh, but, but, you know, we get to focusing on the wrong things instead of the right things. And when something happens in comparison to what I've got waiting for me in glory land, in comparison to something else, we've got it much better than most people. On our worst day here in the United States, it would be the best day for about 90% of the rest of the world. I mean, the money that we, that we will spend this week eating out or buying groceries will probably be more than what many people around the world earn in the whole month where they live. So we need to give God thanks for the many blessings that we have. And then finally, number five, giving thanks transforms worry to peace. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. And I'm giving this to you out of the, uh, uh, the Phillips translation. I've used this verse several times recently. So I thought I'd give it to you out of the Phillips translation. It's an interesting look. Uh, look at the scripture. Don't worry over anything whatever. Tell God every detail of your needs in earnest and thankful prayer. And the peace of God which transcends human understanding will keep constant guard over your hearts and minds as they rest in Christ Jesus. It's a peace that transcends our reasoning. I mean, we've been knocked to our knees by something that's happened, but still we've got this sense of peace knowing that God has not abandoned us. And it's a peace that will keep constant guard over our hearts and over our minds. And this is why we should give thanks. Father, as we come in Jesus' name, I want to thank you, Lord, for the way that you've worked in, to develop this nation of ours. And I know, God, we're not what we ought to be, and I pray that you'll bring revival to the USA. But I'm thankful, Father, for those hardy, faithful spirits that sailed across the seas in search of religious freedom and are the very roots from which our nation has grown and the foundation on which we stand. And, Father, may we remember how you work in our lives and may we truly be a thankful people. We'll give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. I invite you to stand with me as we sing a song of invitation.